My name is Daryl Cloud. Thanks for joining us tonight. Government would tomorrow, that's on Thursday, begin engaging investors with plans to issue bonds to clear debts in the energy sector. According to a statement issued by the special company set to manage the process, the engagement would start with investors in London. The following business desk report has more. According to the statement, governments would raise up to 6 billion CDs under the 10 billion CD bond arrangement. It also appears governments might be issuing the bonds in tranches, with the 6 billion CDs being first. The offer will open next Monday, October 23, in Accra and should be issued over a 7 and 10 year period. The statement also indicates that a special purpose company has been created called ESLA PLC which is sponsored by the Ministry of Finance and rated by all three rating agencies, Fitch, S&P and Moody's. The offer has standard chartered and fidelity banks as managers and will be co-managed by Temple Investments and GCB. The special purpose vehicle company established, ESLA PLC has members drawn from the Energy and Finance Ministry and accounting firm KPMG. Proceeds from the offer will be used to clear the about 2.5 billion energy sector debts. Government is planning to use part of the proceeds from the energy sector levy to settle investors who would also buy into this bond. Now, economist at the University of Ghana, Dr. Ebu Texan, has charged government to implement alternative measures to cushion the economy from collapse whilst it begins implementation of this Ghana Beyond Aid agenda. The agenda launched in Accra today is a key government policy to move beyond receiving aid from partners for development projects. Speaking at the launch, Dr. Ebu Texan urged government to, among others, cut down on public expenditure and pursue issuing diaspora bonds to cushion the uh, economy. China has been able to use trade to grow the economy at a sustained level that they no longer need aid. And so it's a good case study for us to also try to see if we can grow our economies at that level so that we can look beyond aid. And also the fact that our donors are changing their client base. Um, most low-income countries have graduated into low-middle-income country status. And the fact that if we talk about poverty, poverty is now endemic in more of the low-middle-income countries like India, um, Nigeria, and so on and so forth. So if aid is going to go there, then these are the economies that are going to attract the aid. So we need to reposition ourselves and look beyond aid. Now, what are the alternatives? There are two types of alternatives, the foreign alternatives and then our domestic alternatives. The foreign alternatives is to seek foreign borrowing. Like I've mentioned, with a debt to GDP ratio of 67.5 as at the end of May, expected to be about 70.5 at the end of this year, it is not uh, a viable alternative for us relying on external borrowing. Foreign investment is volatile, but then it's, it's an option that we can take a look at. But before we attract the needed investments, either FDI or portfolio investment, we need to make our environment very business friendly. We need to ensure that we maintain macroeconomic stability. Um, businesses will only come in when the economy is stable. We have some political stability, which is always there for us. And um, so it's the macroeconomic stability that is important. We need, of course, to build a business-friendly environment. I mean, as at the end of um, last year, most of the indicators of uh, doing business in Ghana have deteriorated. And we need, as soon as possible, to put in place measures to try to increase um, those indicators of doing good business in, in Ghana. And I'm happy the Vice President has mentioned a few of the initiatives that they are carrying out um, as we speak to ensure that um, our environment becomes very business friendly to attract the needed portfolio investment. Of course, that cannot happen if our capital and financial markets are not well functioning. It's, it's important that um, we have well developed capital markets. It's important that our financial markets are well developed with a very widespread of instruments that will help us to attract um, funding. Of course, and uh, increasingly, migrant returns has also become very important. And, uh, it's another area that we can take a look at. Um, if we can reduce the cost of sending remittances to, to Africa and then to, especially to Ghana, we, we should be able to raise a huge chunk of money from remittances. Apart from that, um, in terms of, um, of, of bonds, we can um, sell diaspora bonds um, to um, um, our 
are indigenous all over the world for them to contribute to the development that is taking place at home. Um, and in a study done by the World Bank in 2008, they mentioned that these are three um, alternatives that countries that are looking beyond aid could also work on to attract a lot of uh, funding. The Bank of Ghana continues on its quest to sanitize the financial sector by naming and shaming. This follows the regulator's recent caution to the public on a series of activities of some financial institutions. The latest is the central bank's warning against the entity named Oboini Preventures Limited, believed to be operating as a deposit-taking business without the requisite license. The Bank of Ghana's decision to name and caution the public from doing business with all institutions operating legally as microfinance companies is expected to culminate in sanitizing the sector. The Ghana Association of Microfinance Companies has welcomed the move by the regulator and is certain it will restore confidence in the industry. This year alone, the Bank of Ghana has issued publications warning the public against doing business with at least five entities for operating illegally. They include Ponzi Scheme, MMM, Hebron Financial Services, Money Doubler, Agro Development Fund Services Limited, with the latest being Obweni Ventures Limited. In each of these cases, the central bank argued that the operations flouted provisions of the banks and specialized deposit taking institutions act. Well, moving on, and some players in the housing sector are calling for a national policy on the adoption of a green building concept. This will see real estate developers use efficient and low-cost materials in the construction of houses in the country. This uh, was made known at the maiden edition of the Ghana Green Building Summit in Accra. Treasurer of the Ghana Real Estate Developers Association, Samuel Tinkrang, outlined the importance of this concept to help bridge the 1.7 million units housing deficit in the country. Here's more in this report. The summit brought together key players in the real estate industry to explore how to utilize efficient building materials to reduce the cost of housing in the country. Treasurer of the Ghana Real Estate Developers Association, Samuel Tinkran, called for a national dialogue on adopting the use of green energy in the construction sector. It's an in innovative, uh, uh, if you like, uh, technology and it's it's, it's something new uh, to us, honestly, uh, in terms of, you know, the benefits. Not many people know about the benefits of going green. And then those who know, uh, the perception that it is an expensive endeavor. And it can be costly, depending on where you source uh, the technology. Um, we need to educate ourselves. And then attitude behavioral change, uh, I mean, it's a new technology. And always, when you are adapting to something new, it takes, it's a process. Uh, it is the business, the primary business of, uh, you know, government to ensure that the people are warehoused. And um, if we are talking of leadership, what I meant is that uh, the, the, the Works and Housing Ministry, for that matter, must play leadership role in sensitizing the citizenry. Speaking to Joy Business, Deputy Director of the Ministry of Works and Housing, Dr. Theresa Tufo said the call for a green revolution in the housing sector is timely. According to her, government is considering ways to successfully implement a national policy on this concept. We have very good policies, but like I said earlier on, uh, there is a need for implementation. But it doesn't rest on government alone. What I've observed is we need to kind of have some linkages, that is research and industry. Most of our policies are on shelves because we've not really linked industry to research. The summit is expected to see all members of Greta pledge commitments to using environment-friendly building materials to reduce the cost of production. Now, to update you on our top story tonight, the National Digital Property Addressing System should improve the business environment and ultimately transform the economy. That's according to President Ekufuado, who is also expecting the initiative to revive collapsed businesses. The system designed by the, uh, the Ghanaian uh, information technology firm, Vocacom, will be hosted by the National Information Technology Agency. 
Speaking at the launch, President Ekufuado noted the initiative is part of reforms towards economic growth. All individuals and properties will be able to obtain their own unique addresses as we strive to build a credible national address register. The national address database creates an avenue for new businesses and industry. I urge all stakeholders, ministries, security agencies, health authorities, educational institutions, lands commissions, financial institutions, private sector operators, to liaise with the Ministry of Communications and Ghana Post. The administration of lands will receive a major boost with the property addressing system. It should help provide a solution to the menace of land guards and the other un unpleasant experiences currently associated with investing in land and real property. We will now have an immovable, digital, unique signature of lands. I applaud Ghana Post for leading the way in the implementation of this initiative. They showed us the way to the world once. So how does this uh, really work? The BBC's Russell Partnor has been sharing with us the UK's experience with the digital property address system. The United Kingdom has actually had what are known here as postcodes for quite a while. They were introduced as long ago as the 1970s after a lot of planning, and they were very helpful for what was at that time developing automation in the delivery of post. Machines could read this postcode, this special number, and it kind of helped the Royal Mail at that time deliver the post much quicker. And slowly but surely it's caught on, and if you were to ask anyone in the UK today, they probably have their own postcode memorized, but it hasn't always worked out that way in other countries. Ireland recently, although Ghana might be introducing this digital system, Ireland has introduced what are known as air codes there just in about the last year or so, and beyond the Dublin city area of Ireland, they're not that popular at all. People don't see why they should have to memorize something. It's not so helpful in rural areas is the argument, but of course then the emergency services, if an ambulance is required to go to a remote house in the countryside or the fire service. There is, of course, the fact that if you can identify an address from the digital code of it, the air code, it's much more useful. But they haven't proved that popular in Ireland. But nevertheless, I suppose I've heard reports from Ireland personally of people saying, well, this is just about businesses trying to mail shot us to get our address so they can read it easier and identify everyone in the country. So people in cities may find them of great use. Certainly businesses do. But beyond the city, in rural parts of certain countries, they're not seen of being that much use. It's all about the impression it creates among consumers. Well, it has been a benefit to businesses, of course, because they get to identify their customers. I get reports from Ghana that banks are saying this will be very helpful when the new digital code comes in because they can identify where their own customers live. Of course, a major question uh, might be raised about why don't banks already know where their customers live. But it is useful just to have a short digital code, but it all depends on how businesses are going to use it, how they encourage their staff to take it on, and also on top of that, how will consumers perceive it. The system won't work if consumers don't use it, so it has to be seen to be easy. As I've said, in the UK, you could ask anyone today what is their special postcode. They could probably tell you uh, the postcode of where they live quite easily. So it does depend on the perception of the customers, the ordinary consumers. Well, when it comes to lessons that Ghana can draw from the British experience, it is really all about introducing a system that works easily. If consumers are to be convinced to take it up, it does really depend on how easy it is to use it and how widespread it's in use. If consumers see it as perhaps just an advantage for businesses of no benefit to them and it's not mandatory to use it, then they may not feel that they want to use it. After all, it's quite a nuisance for certain people having to memorize a new number. 
number. So it really does depend on how the government and the body which has been given the job of introducing the new digital code actually convinces people how easy it is to implement it. If that stage it goes wrong, then it could take many years for the system to come into force. But I should say, of course, referring back to the British system which came in in the 1970s, it was of great use for the postal system. Consumers could see that it would speed up the delivery of letters, so they were very much in favor of it, just like businesses were. But we live in a different age now. We live in the digital world, and this may be of great use to a developing country like Ghana because of this digitization of business. We're all online today, and if you can have a digital code for where you live, that's going to make a very short form of your unique address. As I say, it's all about how the consumers perceive it's going to be of benefit to them. If the customers think it's a good thing, then it's going to work. In other news tonight, the Ministry for Aviation is looking uh, at opening up the aviation industry through collaboration with the tourism sector. The move comes as the ministry forges to make Ghana an aviation hub in the sub-region. Uh, the Minister for Aviation, Cecilia Dafa, spoke to Joy Business after a meeting with Turkish Airlines. As work progresses to make Ghana an aviation hub, the meeting between Turkish Air and the ministry saw the airline pledge support for the upcoming Africa Air Show. Discussions also covered reductions in prices of airfares to support the vision of the industry. After the meeting, Minister for Aviation Cecilia Depa spoke to Joy Business. You know, when we want to link the airline business with tourism or to tourism, so that, you know, 1.2 million passengers come to Ghana every year. How do they come in? By air. By air. That is uh, of no, um, that is not in doubt, you know. And it's very significant that we link up. I've started doing rounds with the uh, um, Minister for Tourism. Like, uh, culture and creative arts and we mean to have a joint committee permanent joint committee to look at all these areas you know I've had an audit of the airports airstrips and the helipads in Ghana so we have a, good, a big view um, that we are using us with the lens to make sure each region is opened up on his part, country manager for Turkish Airlines was optimistic about making more gains in the Ghanaian market as he describes the business environment as conducive. The aviation industry is increasing, especially here in Ghana, outbound and inbound. Then uh, that's why we increase our uh, passengers and everybody is increasing our, their passengers and uh, everybody is happy, I think, here in Ghana. Uh, that's why uh, we would like to increase our uh, passengers. We will we will increase our uh, capacity. So yeah, I can tell you we are very happy. Sheila Tamaklo reporting for Joy Business. You're watching Business Live. We are taking a short break. We'll be back with much more, including the Joy Business van. Welcome back to the program. Now, if you've had an ATM fail you, then you should know how uh, frustrating it is, really frustrating. That was the experience that birthed ZPay, the mobile payment app developed by entrepreneur Andrew Tichia Pia. The mobile financial services firm has risen to become the number one startup in the country. The Joy Business Van is at the ZPay office here in Accra to hear about the success story. It's a busy day at the ZPA office in Accra. Staff are strategizing, brainstorming on how to expand their services and further capture the market. Okay, SOPs, have we been able to do the SOPs? Now, now how far? Okay, cool. Andrew Techiapia is a brain behind ZPA. He had had his own fair share of ATM failures when he needed the service the most. Then he thought there should be a way to make cash go around easily. He thought it through with a friend. I think as as we are, we sat down thinking about many things. One of them at the time was how could we do, um, basically how could we run a mobile money operation that is agnostic. Agnostic meaning independent of banking and independent of telecoms. 
It almost seemed impossible at the time. That was in 2008. It seemed impossible because Andrew didn't have cash then to carry out the idea, but he held on to the vision and in 2014 launched out. To be quite honest with you, I don't know if I was very optimistic. But I, had, I, I, I have a simple belief that you create a belief system. If it works for you, you follow it. And you follow it passionately and diligently. Um, I also felt that mobile penetration at the time was very low from a financial services perspective. Although you, mobile penetration was growing. Gradually, more Ghanaians are subscribing to mobile payments. As Andrew explains, it is quite seamless. I'll send you money, for example. I'm going to send you one CD. You look like a nice guy. <laughs> if you give me your number. Okay, so it's uh, 0203131. Okay. So here, I go in here and I select where I want to terminate to. As you can tell, I have so many banks. I also have Airtel, which we have direct interpretability with. So I've done your KYC, we're plugged up to GVive as well. Mm -hmm. So GVive is a digital compliance platform. I hit submit, less than seven seconds, I've sent you the money. All right, and so I'm going to be checking my phone to see if uh, I get notified, right? Yes. And there you go. The ZPay platform accepts mobile money wallets, debit and loyalty cards, and cash at the point of sale along with operating as a storehouse for holding cash through mobile wallets for members. Andrew and his team aim to rope in 50% of Ghana's unbanked population through his financial services. There's a lot of competition in the space, and that means Andrew has to be strategic. Uh, to stay on top of the game, you've got to constantly innovate, right? But you also don't want to innovate every week because then it's a problem. I think the best way to stay ahead of the game is to have processes in place. We're very process driven. I find that the more processes we have in place, the more standards we embed, the more it makes it easier to innovate. Andrew tells me talent retention is one of the biggest challenges he faces, but that has not stopped his startup from attaining number one status at this year's edition of the Ghana Startup Awards. Financial technology is increasingly growing and as the market gets more digital, Andrew says ZPay will keep innovating. Being able to move and scale from where we are to becoming the largest processor when it comes to remittances, digital remittance termination, um, being able to do a minimum of 100,000 transactions a month. Those who know me will tell you that that will happen. I can assure you that will happen. You can write it in your Bible. You can even take it to the bank. Andrew is counting down to the day ZPay reaches a billion dollar mark in transactions. That should be soon. Welcome back. Time to bring you our interview of the day and the Bank of Ghana in collaboration with other stakeholders is from next month expected to roll out a new strategy to effectively combat fraud in the financial sector. This follows the latest revelation that financial institutions in the country reported about 1,000 cases of fraud in 2016, which amounted to over 244 million Ghana cities. The main fraud cases reported included suppression of customer accounts by staff of uh, financial institutions, card fraud, forgery of documents, and manipulation of accounts. This is contained in the 2016 Annual Payment Systems Oversight Report published by the Bank of Ghana. National Cyber Security Advisor Albert Ndiboisiaku says this must be put in perspective. Interview of the day. Let, let's have the background. Why are we having an increment in, in, the, uh, in the kind of fraudulent cases that are being reported to the central bank? and primarily cyber facilitated fraud. Uh, we need to look at the ecosystem. Within the last few years, what has happened within the financial sector? We got a lot of innovation in the form of digitalization, a lot of e-banking products and services. Any additional e-banking product or service which is added as a banking product, it means it's a target for you know, a fraudster or a cyber attacker. So we should always play the statistics within those dynamics. From where I sit and my own interaction with the central bank, last week we just had a meeting 
before the end of the year, one of the things the central bank is doing as part of government effort is to implement a new um, standard. A kind of a regulations that set the minimum standard for information security, of which the banks are going to, uh, you know, abide by. It has a huge impact uh, on how the financial sector, you know, do their things in terms of information security best practices, the kind of systems that they need to have in place, the kind of personnel that they need to have, and the technical infrastructure that they need to have in place within the financial sector to scale up Ghana's cybersecurity. I think it's a big issue. But I might say before the end of the month, that regulation is coming. Technically, the, the bank is also setting up a computer emergency response team, uh, which is uh, a, technical, a technical infrastructure that will help to monitor the threats that is going on within the banking sector. And this and other uh, specific activities are the ongoing development to arrest the issues. So we are certain that by the end of this month, they should come to full force? Very, very certain. I wish you can also speak to the Bank of Canada to confirm. But my the information I receive, the briefings and the kind of engagement I have, Bank of Ghana is working actively. And I think something should be outdoor before the end of the year. Interview of the day. Well, if you've been monitoring the news today, you may have heard of uh, an exercise to close down some gas stations. There's a, an interesting twist to the story on our website, myjoonline.com. Uh, restaurant operators to use charcoal as gas marketers shut down stations. If you want to read more about it by visiting our website, that'll be it for Business Live. My name is Daryl Crow. We'll see you same time tomorrow.